over today are at are online. So if you want to, sorry, follow along, um, you can browse to slides.unsupported.io, intro to brown bags. Um, and as I progress through the slides, it will uh, progress your slides as well. So um, just to help everyone stay on the same page if you're interested. Huh. So I'll just wait a second in case someone wants to do that. And so I can not start on time. How's everyone doing? Thanks for coming out to the last talk of the conference. <laughs> A lot of people are gone by now. Cool. All right, well, I guess I have to get started. Um, OK, so uh, my name is, sorry, uh, Sarah Ofstall. I am a Linux trainer uh, where I work uh, for the Linux system administrators on our support floor. Um, and my presentation is called Go Forth and Brown Bag. So um, just to get started here. OK, uh, we'll start off uh, just with some basic, sorry, some basic definitions so that we're kind of all on the same page. Uh, what is a brown bag? Uh, brown bag kind of gets tossed around a lot. It can be used in a lot of different contexts and mean a lot of different things. Um, but originally, the term was used in reference to brown bag lunches, uh, which were brought often um, to allow other teammates to stay on location and kind of learn from each other. Uh, just kind of learn tidbits and just little things on the job. So um, they were often during lunch breaks. The time was short. The information was specific. And that's kind of how we will discuss the brown bag training that we talk about today. So my in the, community, in the computer moment. So um, I don't know if what everyone's background is, but I think in a lot of the things that we do, there's always that aha moment uh, of something. So as a system administrator, I know for me, um, I learned semi-early on that there is some functionality with get facul and set facul, uh, those commands. And if you're not familiar, they are commands to manage permissions on files. Uh, but I learned about the functionality that allows you to take a backup of a, of a um, permission structure and restore it if needed. Um, and to me, that was a complete game changer. Um, it wasn't like that was just mind-blowing knowledge, uh, but, but what it did is it kind of changed the way I worked. Um, when I was troubleshooting issues, I was much more confident to try a more creative or effective solution because I wasn't terrified that I was going to blow something away and not be able to take it back. So um, just that one little command kind of changed the way I worked. And that's the kind of training that we're aiming when we give brown bags in, in this context. We're looking for that training that's just that, that tidbit of knowledge that really evolves the way you work without having to be overly complex or overly general. So um, with that, the objective uh, specifically, we're going to cover a step-by-step -step guide. Uh, it's going to walk you through the process of creating material. And it's going to be focused on user story-based content. And we're going to make that content relative to your team your specific team or organization's day-to-day -day workflows. So uh, the other thing about this presentation is there is um, some room for participation. So I will ask you guys <laughs> to participate. And if you could help me out, that would be great. So I'm not standing up here like an idiot. So thanks. OK, so the agenda. We're going to start off with an intro into what I mean with uh, user story based. Uh, we're going to talk about that kind of mentality. We're going to talk about the four steps for creating your brown bag. Uh, you're establishing scope and subject definition, outline creation, filling in action-oriented content, providing resources. And then we'll do a review and a Q&A. So intro to user story-based content. So what exactly is user story-based? What exactly do we mean when we say this? This is actually, user story-based is actually um, a term that's kind of borrowed from agile um, project management. Uh, if you're familiar with that. And this definition breaks it down really well. If you uh, are browsing the slides, you have all the links and everything. Um, but essentially, they reflect what a particular class of user needs and the values to be gained. So when we're approaching a problem, instead of looking at the problem from the developer's perspective, or in our case, from the trainer's perspective, we're looking at the problem or the training from the uh, audience's perspective. So 
What exactly does that mean? That means that when we talk about the training that we're going to create today, it means that we're talking about providing context. Um, I don't know about you guys, but it's really easy for me to start something and then halfway through be like, what the heck was I doing? Um, for me, that's my inbox. Uh, I'll get 30 emails and be like, what was I supposed to get in here for? Um, it's often easy and and the, the reason why we do something can often be overlooked, but um, or the, the want for why we're doing something, but why we're doing something in particular is much easier to remember. Um, and when we talk about user stories, that kind of uh, structure provides a really good um, organization for your thoughts and your process. So step one, um, establishing scope and subject definition with user stories. So specifically, there is a user story template that makes it uh, really simple. Uh, essentially, one of the more popular ones, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, the link that I have on there actually goes through a few of them, but this really popular, simple one is what we're going to use today. So as a persona, I want to sew that. So essentially, as a role, I want to do something so that I can achieve whatever end goal. So uh, a quick note here, the effectiveness of your brown bag will be a direct reflection of the quality of your topic selection and scope definition. If you do not spend the time to make a quality um, subject and to really define your scope, the kind of training that you make, the, the process from here on out is going to be very different than if you had. And the training is going to be a lot less effective um, when you're trying to teach to a much broader um, scope. So oftentimes when we teach something, it's really about choosing a particular lens to teach through. We can't teach through every single perspective, every single situation, but what we can do is we can focus in on a particular context and a particular lens. Um, when we try to use more than one lens on top of an another, things can get distorted very easily. And so what we want to do is we want to stay very focused in the kind of training that we create. So let's, let's look at an example. Um, as I said, I am a trainer um, for the Linux system administrators um, on our support floor. So this is an example written from my perspective. So as a system administrator, I want to be able to verify network connectivity so that I can identify and resolve network issues. So um, let's kind of break this down a little bit. The first part is as a system administrator. Uh, this is kind of where I'd like to get your participation. Um, how can we narrow that down? Is how, can someone give me an example of something that we might put instead of system administrator that's a little bit more focused? Perfect, Unix. Uh, when we say system administrator, that can mean Windows. That can mean a, a ton of different systems. Uh, but specifically, what we're talking about is a Linux. Um, administrator. The other thing is that we can narrow it down by saying a beginner. We can, we can narrow it down by saying as a level one administrator, as a level one Linux administrator. And what that does is that starts to establish your scope. You're, you're putting out there, hey, this, this content is aimed towards a level one or beginner Linux administrator. So you're more than welcome to come to this training if you're a senior administrator. That doesn't mean that you can't come. It doesn't mean that you can't benefit. But know that the scope of the training is going to come from this place. It's going to come from a level one um, perspective. And there are different assumptions that we make with a level one versus a senior administrator. Um, so uh, the things that we improved in option one for option two is the target audience and targeting your audience starts to build that scope foundation. So let's look at the option two. Um, I want to, the original said, be able to verify network con connectivity. Um, there are a lot of things that we can do to verify network connectivity, right? We can verify that the server's up with ping. We can uh, verify that the hardware is online. We can do a lot of things. We can check the routing tables. We can do a lot of things to verify whether a network is connected or not. That's a very broad thing. So when we narrow it down to, I want to use the NetCat tool to establish a port connection, 
on a remote server. So now we've got something very specific. We have a specific tool that we're going to use. We have narrowed down the connection to a port connection versus like a host connection. And then we've narrowed it down to a remote server versus a host server. So what that does is that started to establish, again, exactly what we're going to talk about. Because the more relevant and specific we make our training, the more effective it is for someone. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the so that. Uh, so that I can verify whether a remote server is accepting connections on port 80. So we go from <laughs> establishing a port connection to verifying a specific connection. Now we're, now we're talking about accepting connections on port 80. And one of the reasons that this so that is so important is that it's your end goal. What do you want to be able to do? Why do you want to be able to establish a port connection? What does that tell you? When you use a user story template, you really start to structure down and hone in on why you're doing something and what you need to achieve to get there. So we want to talk about port connections because we want to verify whether connections are open on port 80. That, that could mean a lot of things for a website. So end goal. When you target, you begin to target the behavior. It's accepting, and then you've provided a use case activity on port 80. All together now. So our final user story would look like, as a level one Linux administrator, I want to use the Netcat tool to establish a port connection on a remote server so that I can verify whether a remote server is accepting connections on port 80. That sounds like a really long sentence. Um, I know it doesn't sound great. I know it sounds like the run-on of all run-ons. But we're not trying to win any novel um, awards here. What we're trying to do is be very specific. And that's what that is. It's very specific. It's targeted. It tells you exactly what to expect from this training. And it provides you a structured way of approaching the rest of the material. It's all connected. So. <laughs> Like Charlie in this GIF, all of this, I cannot stress enough, is connected. If you structure your subject carefully, if you take the time to invest in this stuff, it's going to affect the way you create your outline. It's going to affect the kind of content that you put in your brown bag. And it's going to trickle down. <laughs> actually, it's actually going to trickle down and affect exactly how you do the rest of your process. So. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to step two, creating an actionable outline. So what are we working with? What do we have to begin with? We have a specific user story-based subject, and we have the foundation of our scope. So without even creating an outline, we already know what our subject is, specifically what our subject is, and we already know what the foundation of our scope is going to look like. Getting started. So this getting started is what we would get started with if we were talking about um, getting started with the first example. Those are the con th that's the criteria that we have to work with. A system administrator, verify network connectivity, and identify and solve network issues. If you were trying to create training for this, where would you start? Would you start with Windows? Would you start with Linux? What kind of network would you talk, would, would you talk about when you talk about connectivity? Would you go all the way down to packets? Would you talk about traceroute? Would you talk about ping? Um, there's a lot of things that you can talk about. That scope is so broad that it, it gets to be like, how do I even start this? Um, but when we look at our second example, we look at level one Linux administrator. So beginner. We're looking at a smaller scope. We're looking at introductory content. Um, what are we looking at when it, as far as our want to? We're looking at a specific tool. We're not going to talk about all of the other protocols and establishing methods. We're, we are honing down to the specific tool. And with that tool that has many functions, we're going to establish a port connection on a remote server. And we're going to verify whether that remote server is accepting connections. That already has a lot more direction than the last example. So um, your questions not only go change from your audience's perspective, but they change from your perspective too. So rather than what do I include, you start to think about what do I need to include for my audience to be able to accomplish the end goal. So now it's not 
what do I need people to know? It's what do people need to know to accomplish the end goal, to, to meet the desired outcome. And that's a lot more approachable and a lot more um, learnable than something as broad as what do I include? What do people know? How do I get them to know exactly what I need them to know to teach them what I want to teach them? So when we talk about actionable, actionable outline items, what I mean when I say actionable is I'm talking about things that you can actually create an action on. So we're not just talking about an outline that says introduction. Um, it starts with an introduction, sure, we can label it that way, but what we're going to do is in our introduction, we're going to explain why we should do this. So that's an actionable item. I can go through and actually write an explanation on why we're doing it. I can actually go and look up the internal policies of my own company and see how those fit in with our training. We want to create actionable outline items so that when we start filling in our content, we can create our content to be actionable as well, and so that we can create something that's going to be relevant as well as um, focused. So in this example here, I've highlighted what we're going to talk about in the next slide, common flags and examples for netcat command and how this task fix fits in in the overall scope of verifying network connectivity um, and maybe some things we, we might do before running the netcat command. So again, your questions change. You now have a question of when you're creating your outline, does 5.1 or does do common flags and examples uh, contribute to the overall end goal, or does it detract from what we're trying to accomplish? That's how you go through and you start to weed out all of that content. You might end up, we might start with like a 30 list thing, and then when you get down to it, you're like, do they really need to know this to understand how to use Netcat? No, they don't. Yes, they do. You can make those decisions a lot more qualified when you have actionable outline items. Um, can, my re can my audience reasonably apply content? Um, so now you're, you're starting to get a feel for, in the outline process, in the outline stage, is this actually possible? Is this all theoretical? It, can I actually give something for my audience to do on a day-to-day -day basis? So um, creating training fees, super overwhelming. Um, <laughs> creating something, especially for someone else, when you know the complexities of something, can be really, really difficult because there's so much to include. Um, but when you create an outline, there are certain benefits. And I, I get a lot of um, feedback from people who I have create training with me uh, who kind of say, like, well, do I have to have an outline? I already know what I'm going to talk about. And I have to tell you, that even myself sometimes it feels like, why am I writing about what I'm going to do? Um, but there are several significant benefits. And I've just outlined three big ones for you. It helps you organize your thoughts. Um, it's really easy to get in the thick of things, especially on an in-person training, and just go down a rabbit hole. Um, but when you have an outline, you've organized exactly what you want to talk about. So when someone asks you a question, it's not, I guess we can talk about that. It's we can talk about that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over that later, or it's, that's outside the scope of the training. That way you can actually get across what you want to accomplish, rather than ending up 30 minutes in talking about the constructs of a packet. Um, you can reuse it for your presentation agenda. Um, I feel like an agenda is a lot like an ad blocker. When you put your agenda at the beginning of your presentation, you let people know what to expect. And like an ad blocker, when it's working, you don't really know. Like maybe someone did have a question about what you were going to go over, but it was covered in the agenda. So now they don't have to ask you. Or maybe um, they, they think like, oh, um, are you going to cover this in detail? You can say, oh, it's on the agenda. It's the last thing we're going to talk about. So it's going to be really quick. Um, it really helps your audience keep you on track as well. And then it also solidifies your scope. So if you're writing down actionable items, you're further defining your scope. You're, you're saying, this is what I'm going to talk about. And it's not introduction. It's, I'm going to explain why we need to do this. I'm going to explain how our internal policies might hinder us from a best practice in this case, or might promote a best practice that we have to use. Um, it really solidifies how far you're going to go and how focused you're going to get. So that takes us to step three, creating action-oriented content. 
So um, just to kind of go back to the objective here, because we kind of have gone on a path, but I really want to focus on creating content that's relative to your team or organization's day-to-day -day workflows. And that you can, there are certain things that you can do um, that really encourage that kind of content and that really are suited for that content to be effective. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about action-oriented and um, the alternative, which is feature-based. Um, but before I do that, I kind of want to address something uh, that I get that I hear a lot of, and I hear a lot of people saying that they want hands-on practice. Um, I think that that is a little misguided. Um, I'll never forget the hands-on practice that I had as a system administrator uh, while I was working on a database, and there was a replication error on the slave. And so I asked one of the administrators on the floor, hey, uh, I don't know how to fix this. Can you help me? Yeah, just go ahead and run reset slave. Like, oh, OK. That was hands-on practice. If you're, not if you're not familiar with what that can do, that was a lot of data loss that day. Uh, essentially, we just blew away um, Thursday's transactions for a company because we essentially just reset everything. Um, that was hands-on. It was training, um, but it wasn't exactly valuable. Um, I think what people actually benefit from is action-oriented, um, relevant examples, rather than actually being on a hands-on environment. Um, so I just kind of want to differentiate that really quickly. So what do we mean when we say action-oriented, specifically? And, and what do we mean when we say feature-based? So there are kind of two um, general rules of, of creating content. Um, and this is an example of if you're trying to learn how to make an onion omelet. I don't know why one would make an onion omelet, but if you were trying to learn how to do that, you could go with a feature-based, which is this first example. You could learn everything you need to learn about onions. You can learn how to peel an onion, cut an onion, fry an onion. Those are all things you need to know. Um, but you could also go with a more action-oriented method, which is um, setting up your workplace. How can you know how to peel or cut onions if you don't really know how to set up your workspace, if you don't know what knife to use, if you don't know what's going to cut, how to cut, um, how do you prepare your ingredients, how do you select spices? Those are all kinds of things that you're going to do in your actual process of making the onion omelet versus the features of the, of the, of the parts that go in an onion omelet. So um, I kind of compare this to learning how to drive. Uh, when you learn how to drive a car, someone doesn't hand you the manual and say, hey, here are all of the capabilities of a car. Learn this first, and then we'll get behind the wheel. There's driver's ed, but it's very practical. It's when you get on the road, you have to stop at stop signs. Uh, when you get into a traffic accident, there are certain procedures that you have to take. You don't just read the manual. You actually get that hands-on experience, and the learning is geared towards you actually getting behind the wheel of a car first. So um, here, I just want to give an example of what this kind of looks like. Uh, before we're talking about an example about using the netcat command, so in this example, I have what that command would look like if I ran it, and what the actual output would be from that command. Alternatively, if we were talking about a feature-based example, we would talk about using the man page. We could explain the man page. We could give someone a man page and say, well, look it up. It tells you exactly what to do. Technically, it does tell you exactly what to do, but I would like to argue that reading a man page is a skill unto itself. Um, it's a very complex thing, and especially when you're just starting out and just trying to learn, you don't know how these things relate to your actual job. You just know it's capable of this. That's, that's much more advanced training. Uh, so when we're talking about gearing towards something new, we're really talking about a specific context. Uh, kind of going back to my original example, um, someone taught me just one functionality, how to run it in my day-to-day -day job. And it was a very specific thing, but it wasn't, um, 
And it wasn't overly complex, but it completely changed the way that I worked because it had context around it. Because I was on the job and I was saying, I think this is the right answer, but I don't want to change it because I don't know. Um, it completely changes the way you look at things when you have context around something. Um, and so a feature-based training item is, is really difficult to provide that context around. So the other benefits that you get with action-oriented items are you get that first exposure. So when you run, there's a certain confidence, right, to taking the training that you get and actually applying it to your day-to-day -day job. There's that blocker. If you, if you really just needed to go and look something up, you could go and look something up and Google it and go and apply it, but there's that confidence factor um, that you don't get um, by yourself. When you're giving training, though, you have you have the ability um, to give someone that first exposure. You have the ability to show someone, hey, when you run this command, this is what it looks like. This is what you should expect to see when you run this command. Um, you can also tailor your examples. So you can tailor exactly what you're looking for. Like, how would you use the netcat command? Um, in our example here, um, we talk about what you actually see when you run the command, you see a warning. Um, the actual output of that would be warning, inverse name lookup failed. Well, that kind of sounds like, oh, did I do something wrong? Did this command fail? Did it actually do what I needed it to do? When you're completely new, warning and fails, th those are really intimidating. And there's a certain confidence to, well, I don't really know if I did it or not. Um, the other thing is that we've got the command specifically towards a domain. So before we just defined we wanted to we wanted to check a remote server, but in actual practice, what we mean by server is, is probably a domain a lot of times. We want to see, hey, um, is example.com expecting uh, accepting connections on 80? And we can see the output here at the bottom um, versus a man page. Um, you don't get that context. You don't get the, oh, the warning is okay. Okay, I didn't mess anything up. I didn't cause an error or anything, and it did do what it, I expected it to do. Um, and then you can address that in your training as well. You can say, if you don't want to get this error, there's a flag you can run that doesn't do a reverse DNS lookup, so you don't get that error. You can kind of address like what people are going to run into before they run into it by themselves. Choose wisely. You must choose, but choose wisely. Um, this article that I've linked here is really, really great on kind of explaining uh, user stories uh, for documentation. Um, a good example of that would be like a man page or like the Apache documentation versus like a DigitalOcean article. Everybody loves DigitalOcean articles. I love DigitalOcean articles. They're action-oriented. They give you context around what you're running. Um, this article does a really good job of explaining how to make documentation specifically, um, but, but basically, he kind of highlights that there's a time and a place for both. There's a, kind, there's a time and a place for both kinds of training. Um, when you're getting into the more advanced trainings, like when you're teaching someone like, hey, you already know exactly how Netcat works. You know all of the fundamental concepts you need to understand in order to troubleshoot a networking infrastructure. You really just need to know this really specific nuanced information. Then we might look at a feature-based documentation. We might look at a feature-based training session. Either way, just know that when you present your material, you are choosing one or the other or a variation, and just be aware of what you're choosing. Just make sure that you're making a choice, and you're not just throwing something out there and not really thinking about the kind of thing that you're, that you're providing for people. So that takes us to our last step, providing resources. So the big one here is don't reinvent the wheel. Um, remember when IHOP turned into IHOB and it was horrible? It's because they tried to reinvent the wheel. They didn't need to change their whole name to sell burgers. Kind of like you don't need to completely create a whole mountain of resources to back up your training. Um, curate versus create. Every single resource that I have in here is from the internet. Every single resource that I have to give you is from somewhere else. I'm not the first one to say these things. I'm just, a, I'm just someone providing some context around them for you. So if you're teaching someone how to use a command or how to use um, a certain software, there's already training 
on that. And once they get that initial contacts and that initial exposure, they're going to be a lot more empowered to go and look at that material. Um, so curate your resources. Go and find where that Red Hat access documentation is and link that in there um, for them to look at later. Um, the other thing is, if you are going to create something, uh, create, uh, think about whether you're creating reference material or standalone material. Um, if you're giving an in-person training, you don't really need to create material that should stand alone. You're giving that training and your context and your resource. And so when you give material for someone to continue their learning, it's more of a reference rather than teaching them all over again. They already should have learned some concepts. They already should have learned some basic fundamental things from your training session. And what they really need is just a reference. Like, oh, what was that one command and that one flag? Uh, what was that one thing that she said? That's something that is a reference and not necessarily a standalone. So don't create a whole novel. Um, just create a few little bullet points uh, if you really want to create something yourself. Um, and then lastly, don't forget that you are a resource. Um, if you are standing in front of a crowd talking to people, you're there for questions. You're there for that instant feedback. The training that you give should be tailored towards the kind of audience that you have. And if you're giving training, it's, it's in person. Uh, you are the resource. You, you are the first resource. Um, so don't feel like you have to have something in order to get up in front of someone, especially for that initial exposure. Um, when we talk about training today, we really talk about um, a training that kind of provides a door. Uh, it, it's, you're never going to learn exactly how to do something in a 45-minute session. No one's going to be able to teach you exactly how to do something and all of the intricacies and nuances that come with whatever you're learning. But what they can do is they can open a door for you so that you can get that initial context, so that you can get that initial understanding and carry it forward and continue to learn. Um, back to my example, I didn't learn all of the ins and outs of permission structures or get FACL or, or even just regular like UMask stuff for a long time after that. Um, but what I did learn was this one simple thing that kind of gave me the confidence to move on and do different things. It opened the door for me to learn more. And that's really what you want to achieve when you're giving it an in-person training. OK, review. I'm just going to take a drink of water first. OK, so we talked about establishing scope and our subject definition with user stories. So specifically, we talked about how to do that with a user story template. We talked about creating an actionable outline. Uh, we talked about creating more than just intro, step one, step two. Talked about creating an outline with actual items that you can go through and make an action off of. We talked about action-oriented content. Uh, we talked about the kind of examples that go with action-oriented content. That, that kind of stuff is really how you tailor your experience to your workplace. If you are creating content that has a specific example with specifically how you would run it in your environment, it's a very tailored example and it's very action oriented. It's for that person to go out and run it or a variation of it. Um, when people see that first context, um, not only do they get the first exposure like we talked about, but they see how that learning is going to be used. So when you give someone an example of how you are currently using it, they know how to take that and apply it to their own surroundings um, because that's the way that they are going to use it. Um, when you do a feature-based kind of thing, it kind of leaves it open for, well, okay, I don't know how I would use that. But when you're specific in your examples, it's like, okay, well, I don't need to netcat for domain or example.com, but I need to check an IP address. I can probably still do that. I just need to find the flag. When you are more specific, it's actually a lot more relevant, even if it seems like it's a little backwards um, versus generalized. And then finally, providing resources. Uh, curate, curate, curate. Whatever you're saying, someone has probably already said it and spent a lot of time saying it, and it's probably said pretty well. Um, let that person sub supplement what you're teaching someone. Um, and with that, we are we're through. So we've got a few minutes for questions. Yes, please. Um, isn't there one that's great for that? Like, you have this busy industry and the more training that you give to our parents, like, that will kind of get them um, to your audience. 
Yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, um, when you're giving training, is confidence really the main thing that you're trying to achieve? Um, of course, that really depends on what you're trying to do. But if you're specifically teaching someone how to do something at work, how to do an actionable item, then oftentimes it's mostly a confidence thing. Um, the, the people that you're working with, your coworkers, are probably pretty intelligent people. Um, you know, they, they could probably Google something, like I said before. But what they don't have is that confidence. What they don't have is you right next to them saying, this is OK, right? And so what you're trying to establish with those tailored examples and with those action-oriented things is that, is that buildup of confidence. Um, so I would say that that's a huge thing. And the other thing is just making it one of the ways to do that and one of the other things that you really should focus on is just really tailored specific examples. So, go ahead. Since you're showing so with such specific examples, what kind of, how, how long do you expect one of these trainings to take? Like, are you shooting for an hour or is it just a few minutes? So typically brown bags run about 45, 30, 30 45 uh, minutes. And your example should be pretty succinct. Um, so when you're, when you're working with action-oriented examples, they kind of speak for themselves. Um, you kind of just have to say, like, look, see, this is how you would do this. Um, and they kind of speak for, and you don't have to explain as much as if you're actually trying to explain that to someone than if you're trying to show someone. Um, so 30 to 45 minutes is really what you're aiming for um, when you're talking about something really specific and focused. Um, there's, there's other kinds of trainings. There's week-long trainings, and that's a different talk. But today, uh, I really wanted to focus on this because I think it's really doable. I think um, you can find 30 to 45 minutes in your workday, hopefully, at some point um, to kind of help out your coworkers or to get help. The other thing that I didn't mention is um, creating training is a really good way to learn something. Um, one, of the, one of the best things to learn something is to teach something. And all of the kind of research and things that go into those um, are, are really garnered in teaching someone else. You kind of don't feel like you're a senior developer until you're helping other people, right? Because then you're really explaining and, okay, this is actually how this works. Um, one of the things with the way we do it is when you provide a template for people, it's a lot easier for someone who may not know exactly a whole lot about the subject to actually get started. So hey, here's a template. Uh, as a something, I want to, so that. Um, it makes it a lot more approachable for someone to learn something. Anything else? Yes. Uh, so can I just ask, like, um, what you guys are doing here? Like, are you trainers? Are you seniors? Are you beginners? Are you just curious? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so you're kind of looking for ways to give training then. Are you going to? Yeah, the more I and I have I can't emphasize this enough. The more specific you are, the more relevant it's going to be. Um, it's it's not just you, you don't have to speak to a broad generalization. Um, there are a lot of similarities and patterns you find with very specific material. Anyone else? Can you tell me why they're here. Yeah. And how can we make this better both so that it's understandable? Because someone who's a new professional isn't going to 
and say, oh, this makes sense because of all these possible factors. So how do you condense those historical factors with some context of how it makes their lives better? Right. Even if it has flaws. Yeah. So that's kind of one of the battles that we have too. We have a really specific infrastructure that has limitations. And so a lot of our training is, how do you get around this limitation? Why does it make sense to run this this way? Um. Uh, yeah, so I really like reveal.js. Uh, that's what I'm using for mine. Um, it's pretty flexible. Um, reveal.js, yeah. Um, you have to know a little bit about um, CSS. That's actually how I'm learning CSS, is uh, using this. But um, it's more interactive, like you said. Uh, there's a lot more capabilities than just doing a PowerPoint with a theme, um, yeah. A website for what? A little thing to try. Mm -hmm. I have not gone that far. That is something that I'm working on right now. So I'm actually one of the things I'm working on is I'm releasing um, kind of. So I'm going to start taking feedback with the user template. So like, hey, if you want to request training. Um, use the template to request it so I know what level you are. I, it's a lot more um, accurate data. Um, and then it's also more tailored towards, I get a lot of requests and I'll be like, well, why do you want that? And they're like, well, I want to be able to do this other thing. I'm like, okay, but that's not how you do that. Um, and so that kind of will help with that. But one of the other things is we have so many resources um, within our infrastructure. I work for Rackspace. We're a hosting company. And so we deal with so many different things. We have so many talented people. Um, and we really want to tap those resources. But to make that happen, you kind of have to make it easy. Um, and so one of the other things I'm working on is a template for creating a training document as well as like a brown bag. Anything else? Texas. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, our um, headquarters is in Texas for the US. Yeah. Blacksburg is one of our data centers. Oh, okay. So, so I know why people like it. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Anyone else want to tell me why they're here? I know volunteering is just so great. I'm going to make eye contact with every single one of you <laughs> <laughs> till you tell me why you're here. Just this talk. I just want to know why, why, why are you here? Like, <laughs> why, what is here? <laughs> yeah. That's true. There's nothing else to go to, really. Uh huh? Um, so I've been a trainer for a few years now, um, and I created our onboarding uh, process, and I created, I'm creating our leveling process, um, and a lot of the things that come with that is making other trainings to go along like that. So. <laughs> to change from a system administrator to a trainer? Uh, no, so I was kind of already, I, um, the role didn't exist before me, but I was kind of doing that stuff. Like I was interested in learning more, and so I was like setting up study groups, and I was like setting up like um, certain uh, guides and stuff for people to follow, and um, our director just approached me and was like, hey, would you like to do this? Like we, we need this, um, and I think you'd be good at it, and so... That's kind of, yeah, that, it's, it's a classic case of I was doing it before I actually started officially doing it. Yeah. It, and that's kind of why I encourage brown bags in general is because I got started just telling my team how to do this stupid thing that I learned how to do. 
or telling, uh, having someone else teach me like, well, how do you get around that like weird error all the time because our infrastructure is like ha down half the time? Like, what, what do I do? Um, and so like those little things are kind of what I really started to want to learn to kind of get to the next level. Because um, a lot of times like senior administrators aren't just like, I mean, they're really smart, but they also, they, they're really smart at working in their environment. And so it's like, hey, so-and-so knows who to talk to to get that thing. So-and-so knows how to push that through because he knows like how our back end works. So like learning all of those little intricacies really add up to being like a consistent, well-rounded engineer. And so that's kind of what I was looking to do and just kind of came from there. Cool. All right. Well, my computer is telling me I'm done. So <laughs> thank you.